morning, everyone. How are you guys? Um, I'm Beth Thompson, and this is Laura's, Liz Horvat, and we're from okay. we're from Gates Memphis Plus State down in the South Side. Uh, we're one of the fastest growing companies in Pittsburgh, and also one of the best places to work for five and six years um, today. And we're going to be talking about the relationship between social media and paid media. And before Liz and I actually started working together, we were interns somewhat long ago. We won't tell you how long ago. Um, and never really crossed paths. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, as Beth kind of touched on, we're going to really talk about um, the importance of working between paid media and social media, and kind of how um, nowadays you really have to bridge that gap and be integrated. Um, so we interned a few years ago. I was in the media department, still am, Beth PR, still is. Um, but part of today's presentation is talking about how, with Facebook especially, um, paid is such an important piece of a social media strategy, and we're going to be, we constantly work together to kind of bounce ideas off of each other, as well as just stay up to date with the changes, because, again, as we'll talk about, Facebook is ever-changing, I'm sure you guys can see that just with your own personal use on Facebook. Um, so, yeah, so we didn't really, didn't really work too much together back then, but as things continue to change, um, we sit right next to each other and are constantly working together. So my specific area of discipline is actually in public relations, but at Gazeman Plus Dave, we believe that social media is part of public relations because it's all rooted in that relationship management. So therefore, really, that's why we, we work to establish that engagement. But Liz and I do work very closely together, even though we are on separate departments. And we're going to go through um, some of the reasons why we've worked to establish this strong bond over the um, coming years. So what we're really going to be focusing on is the evolution of Facebook. Not necessarily since its first inception, but really um, how it's changed for brands specifically over time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a look at, um, starting 2009-2010, really the focus here was brands just getting to the masses that's on Facebook. Really it was just working to establish that initial um, actual presence. Right, and you know, we say back in 2009-2010, like that was years ago, but it is quickly changing. Um, so, you know, in 2009, 2010, brands knew that they needed to have a presence, so you saw an increase in, fan, in brand pages, and um, there was paid advertising, and people, you know, brands and businesses knew that they needed to be involved somewhat, but they weren't really sure exactly how that would impact their pages or really what they were doing at that point. It was kind of like a learning experience and just getting in the game and getting involved. So the shift in 2011 was really about building that data. So we had the masses that are there, but how can we make this a quality experience for the people who are part of these communities? Just being a number wasn't enough. This is about the time that brands really started understanding the, the business intelligence that they had at their fingertips based off of this community presence. Right, and um, with the Facebook, with the ads at that time, it was really about building that fan base. So you saw a lot of what we call like gating, you know, um, like our page and get access to all these deals or like our page and get access to videos or whatever the case may be. So um, really building up that fan base um, was important at that time. In 2012, Facebook really shook things up with the introduction of Timeline, and we're going to go into a lot more detail there. But really the focus was on that engagement. So how can we make sure that we're having a rich experience for the users that are on Facebook? And with Timeline forcing that change, really they also forced brands to be more smart with the content that they were sharing with their communities on Facebook. Because at that time, new updates were being made to their algorithms where not every single status update that were shared on behalf of brands were actually going into the news feed. So everything was super strategic and very smart for brands to, to be able to get that messaging across. And you saw with the, the ads, um, all of the ads were focused on getting that engagement up. So now you know, you've got your fan base, now what do you do with them? How do you get in front of them and make sure that they're seeing your messages? Um, so like Beth said, um, Timeline really shook things up because it introduced a plethora of new ads that hadn't been available yet. 
and it wasn't so much um, number of fans, but what percentage of those fans were engaged. And I'm not sure if you guys know this, but um, within brand pages, you're actually able to see engagement of other brands, so it's almost like a competitive thing. For example, if you click the little thumbs up button on a brand's page, you can see people talking about this versus their fan base, so you can do that math yourself to figure out what percentage of their fan base is actually engaged with the page. So. Um, again, the shift really became focused on engagement and making sure that your fan base was really seeing what your brand had to say. I think around that same time too, um, Facebook's ad units were really um, kind of blurring the lines between what looked like a normal status update versus what was actually paid content. And Liz is going to talk a lot about, about that in um, a little bit. But really, what's going on right now? And it's still about that authentic community experience. And primarily, that's the focus there is through visual storytelling. So you want to have a very rich experience. And brands are understanding that and being super smart with the content that they're sharing. Right. And, um, you know, ads, I, you know, we see them every day. It's a lot of clutter. But now it's about making sure that the message that is in front of you is really relevant to you. So. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about is the targeting that's now available with the ads and how that's getting much smarter so that the messages that you're receiving are really relevant to you. And Facebook, as of a couple weeks ago, is giving you some more control over what's in your newsfeed and what you're seeing. So brands now, again, it's not just about paying for engagement, but making sure that whatever is in front of their fan base is relevant so that they continue to see those messages and keep coming back. So. I'm going to talk a lot about targeting and what I call hyper-targeting, um, which is just basically being very effective with the messages you're sending out and who you're reaching. So you can see when we started back in 2009, 2010 to what is now, you know, the social media strategy and the ad focus might have been a little bit different, but really now it's much more seamless and much more integrated, and that's why this partnership is so strong. So why the changing landscape? Why is Facebook constantly updating things? Well, it's because they can. Um, Facebook is sitting on top of exclusive data. Everyone in this room is sharing information with Facebook that you might not even share with your colleagues or some of your closest friends. So Facebook is sitting on top of this exclusive data that no other company has. Match that with their innovative corporate culture where Facebook is so focused on being the quickest to release technology that they don't really care if it's done or if it's perfect. They just want to get it out there. They focus on that Q&A testing a little bit later. So this is the corporate culture that they have. You match that exclusive data and that innovation, Facebook is sitting on top of a gold mine. And guess what? We're always going to allow them to change things because they're the behemoth that is Facebook and there's nothing we can do about it. But for us, as brands, we must be smart, and we must be quick, and we must be nimble. And that's one of the most important messages that we're going to be sharing with you guys today. So Facebook hasn't ever really been you know, too shy about sharing what their mission and, and statement is. They're working to make the world a much more open and connected place. But since Facebook recently filed for IPO, I think it was last spring, you know, we're wondering how much of that mission is actually true. They saw the tremendous opportunity to actually bring in revenue um, through Facebook advertising. So taking a look at just some general stats, I believe 80, about 80% 80 of the revenue that's coming into Facebook is through advertising. So filing for IPO definitely made a difference, but how does that compete for, you know, their altruistic um, mission statement, which is to make the world open and connected? So. We talked about timeline shifting everything up, and timeline was actually introduced around the same time IPO was they filed for IPO. So at this time, when timeline was introduced, this was the true challenge to brands. How are you, as a brand manager, going to make sure that your content is getting into the audiences? And that's where paid advertising came into play. Not, that, not necessarily did Facebook say that. But as brands, we had to realize that was a big new adoption for timeline. So, yes, that's this cute little puppy piece. <laughs> um, so at the same time that timeline was introduced, Facebook had their programmers working on an algorithm that forced brands to be more creative in their approach. How many of you guys have heard of Edrick? 
few of you. Okay. So Edric's algorithm is how um, how a content is determined to make its way actually into newsfeed. And Edric actually considers three different things. First, the affinity, second, the weight, and third, the time decay. So affinity means how much you are interacting with the content. This could be um, from both your personal or your, um, from as a brand manager. So if you're liking, commenting, and sharing things, that content from your brand page or even from your friend is more likely to make its way into the newsfeed because you're engaging with it. The weight of it, the quality of the content that we keep talking about. Does it have a photo? Does it have a video? Does it have a link? Is it more rich than just a text update? So certainly that's important as well. And then the time decay. You're not going to see a two-week-old post in the top of your newsfeed. Um, but that's certainly all those different things that are, are impacting newsfeed. So what does that mean? When Timeline initially was introduced, that meant only about 26% of status updates actually went into newsfeeds. Mm -hmm. But as of August of uh, this year, Facebook actually updated that. They said at any given time, you could log on to Facebook, and there would be about 1,500 stories that go into your newsfeed. But obviously, that's not really a possibility. So they used EdgeRank to dwindle that down to about 300 stories. Um, with the new update, really what they're looking at um, is taking the content that you're seeing. So they say, on average, users only scroll through about 57% of all the news feed that you have in there. What if there was something really cool in that 43% that you missed, that you just didn't get to? So this minor tweak to the EdgeRank algorithm actually considers how many of your friends, how many of your network are engaging with the content that you may have missed, and they're going to put it up there. So something I may have missed yesterday, maybe it was... Cat content <laughs> will 100% of the time make it to the news feed. Okay. <laughs> um, but this is my cats. Of course, they made it to this presentation. Um, no, but, but Facebook identified this post as being engaging enough to actually appear within the news feed um, multiple times and even over the course of two days. Basically because my friends and family like the post, commenting, and coworkers, so they're seeing within my fan base that multiple different groups are interested in my cats and their new scratching posts. So um, that's just a shift in edge rank because when we're, when we're talking about time decay, and relevancy, engagement, um, they are really interested in making sure that whatever's in the news feed they deem interesting to your friends and uh, in your family or whoever that you're connected to. So they're considering more than just those three factors and they can shift that algorithm slightly to make sure that whatever is in the news feed is interesting to who you're connected to. So I guess I missed this post yesterday, but Facebook thought I really needed to see Liz's cat, so they brought it into my news feed today. So that's just one minor tweak that we're seeing and we think that the algorithms are going to continue to be tweaked over time they might not always be as forward-facing, Facebook might not be as forward-facing, but they said, as of August, they're going to do a little bit of a better job. So we're going to be keeping tabs on them to see if that's really the case. So wanting to make sure that you know, you're not only getting the messages from your personal friends and your personal um, family, but how can brands ensure that their messages are being seen? What if you're kicking off a campaign tomorrow and you're scared that only 20% of your audience is going to get it? That's where we look to promote it, to promoted posts. Right, do you want me to switch? So this is where we're going to kind of chat more through the paid offerings. Um, promoted posts just being one of the many different tools that we now have in our tool chest to make sure that we're in front of people. Um, but this was really kind of pushed out with timeline. Again, the idea being, you know, you've got your fans now like and making sure that they're seeing your content. This is just one way to do it. That kind of kicked off um, all of these new paid placements that you could use within Facebook. So I'm going to talk a little bit, like I said, about the state of, the, of Facebook ads. Um, one thing that, oh, yeah. One thing that's important to note is when you're talking about Facebook now being a publicly traded company, you know, they need to make money. Um, so when you look at digital advertising as a whole and what they're kind of at one point what they were competing against, but I'll talk to how now they want to be included in, in that uh, digital display set. 
Um, when you looked at last year's total display advertising, you're looking at $36.6 billion. Facebook only had 6% of that, which accounted to $2.2 billion, still a lot. But if I were Facebook and what they are doing is looking at that and thinking, well, we could have much more of a larger piece of the pie. How can we get more involved? How can we be considered not just Facebook, but as a digital solution in addition to all of the other digital solutions that advertisers are looking at? So we're going to talk a little bit about how that's kind of evolved and how they're looking to be um, you know, a, another partner like everyone else within display. One thing I hear a lot about, um, just through friends and family who know what I do for a living, I constantly get, oh, I never click on an ad. I see those Facebook ads all the time. I'm never interested, blah, blah, blah. And um, typically, it's you know my cousin in college who's always telling me that what I do is pointless and blah, blah, blah. But um, interesting enough, she got served an ad for yogurt. Um, it was like this new brand of yogurt. I can't remember the name of it. But she had actually purchased that yogurt the same week that she received the ad. And it was for a coupon. Um, I think that's probably a coincidence, but the idea is she was served something that was very relevant to her um, and something that you know she did click on. She she got that offer and went and purchased more yogurt. So I think that Facebook ads and ads in general are not ads when they're effective and when they're super targeted to you and it's something that you actually want to click on. So um, this idea that you know I never see these ads, so why is Facebook investing and why are these advertisers there? Um, really good advertising, which we're going to talk to, doesn't appear as ads. It's something that you want and you're going to click on. You don't even realize it's an ad. We're going to talk a little bit about some ad creation tools that get into that targeting. The first is Power Editor. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with Power Editor? That, okay, cool. So, um, you know, when I first started working with a lot of the new placements within Facebook, our Facebook reps always told us Power Editor is where it's at, that's where anything that's in beta testing is going to eventually come and, and be accessible through Power Editor. And that's true. Um, Power Editor lets you access really new, like for example, polling or mobile or different types of targeting um, are available in Power Editor. But that's not just the only thing now that you have to consider because things are changing so much. Um, but real quick, this is what Power Editor looks like for those, I think this works, that aren't um, familiar with it. This is basically your ad preview. You can um, work on creative here, your audience, um, and optimization and pricing. It's really fluid. You can save with whatever is in Power Editor, which will let you build out campaigns easier the next time around. So it saves a lot of time if you haven't used Power Editor. Um, especially for those campaigns that are like super geo-targeted by zip codes where you're manually typing in a bunch of tiny zip codes, this is where uh, you're going to save a lot of time. So look into it, it'll, it'll show you the breakout more of how to build out the ads. It's really easy to use, but what I like most about Power Editor is the ability to save your information, which lets you quickly optimize for future campaigns and build out new campaigns quicker. The next is Ads Manager, which is kind of what the default, like if you were to go into create an ad, you'd be sent to Ads Manager. Um, when Power Editor was kind of the only thing that we looked at because we were waiting for ads to fall through beta testing and, and be available to us, Power or I'm sorry, Ads Manager was also going through its own facelift. One of the things that's really helpful is this right here, which lets you um, define where your ad placement will go if it's in a news feed versus right column. So making it more visible to mobile and tablet devices. So just getting smarter with where you're putting your ad. You know, if you're reaching a younger audience, you're going to want to make sure it's in a news feed because chances are um, your demo is going to be accessing Facebook through their iPhone or uh, tablet device, whatever the case may be. So just being able to have more freedom over exactly where the ad is going to be seen that's available um, in Ads Manager and to some degree in Power Editor too. But really the idea behind these two different ad tools is figuring out exactly what you're trying to do and making sure that you're using all the tools within Facebook to most effect effectively develop these campaigns. The other thing that um, was kind of interesting as of this year is Facebook's push to really get all types of brands and businesses involved no matter what your size is. So like small mom and pop shops have 
um, are, are able to kind of get a jump start on Facebook and then even larger brands have new things that are available to them. So they, they set up these three programs earlier in the year, Start to Success, Fast Track, and Premium. I'm going to kind of go through these pretty quick, but essentially the idea behind it was getting people or brands, no matter what their size is, to come to Facebook and spend some more ad dollars and teach them really how to make an effective campaign. So the first start to success required a $50 a day minimum for 30 days, so $1,500 for about a month. Um, with this, you would receive free one-on-one -on -one support for 30 days, access to basically all the different types of ads within Power Editor and Ads Manager. Um, and then you get, after that 30-day phone support, you get access by email to Facebook reps, again, to help educate these smaller brands on what's available within Facebook so they keep coming back and learn how to build effective campaigns. The second was Fast Track, which is basically the same type of support as um, the smaller brand package, the 1500 minimum. But then after that 30 days, you get phone support. So you don't have to send an email, you can call them. So again, like just enticing different business sizes to make sure they're coming back and spending money and learning how to use Facebook. The third is the premium package that is for larger brands. Um, primarily because the minimum spend at that time was 50 to 50K a month, which would give you access to the logout screen, which I think we're all familiar with now, as well as ads and different types of targeting that were going through beta. So those are the, the really the platforms to get people to come into Facebook and spend more, and um, we'll talk a little bit about how it appears to be working, but I want to also touch on some of the trends, um, as I kind of alluded to, in, our, in the earlier part where we talked about the evolution of Facebook, and that's really how targeting has changed within Facebook. Um, so like I said, that word hyper-targeting, um, really taking a look at, am I making you guys dizzy out of this? Um, how Facebook targeting is evolving and changing, and one of the big first pushes is the Facebook exchange which basically lets you do something similar to what, you've been, what advertisers have done across the display site side of things, which is retargeting. Um, are, are you guys all pretty familiar with retargeting by show of hands? Okay. okay, some of you. So I'll just quickly go through what retargeting does and why it's important in this case. Um, so let's use the example of JetBlue. You're on JetBlue's website. So Cookies, which I think we're all familiar with, are being collected based on your online behaviors. So because you've accessed JetBlue, you've got all these different companies, and there's way more than that, that are saying, okay, this person went to JetBlue, they're interested in JetBlue. So then when you go to Facebook, all of those companies have that information that categorized you as someone that might be traveling soon or a fan of JetBlue or interested in whatever as it relates to that particular brand and action. So then when you get to Facebook, you might get served a message like this, um, an offer specific to JetBlue. So um, this happens all the time. I'm sure, like especially now after this conversation, you're going to be much more aware of it. But within your Facebook feed, for example, I get served ads way too many times for like Kate Spade or Boots um, based on my online behaviors which I'm fine with because chances are that's a coupon for something that I'm going to want to purchase. So when I talk about how I don't care you know, if it's relevant to me that it's not an ad, it's something that I'm interested in that's going to be helpful, um, that's why I think you know, retargeting is important because up until the Facebook exchange, all that previous online behavior was limited to these other sites. So advertisers weren't able to follow you to Facebook, but when you think about your online behaviors, so much of your time is spent on Facebook. So that's why it's really important that now we're able to re-message you once you get to Facebook as well. What's interesting is something that's been kind of teased out that I'm, I'm you know, waiting to see happen as well, which is, hasn't really you know, started yet is not only using your offline data, but also using, or not, not only using your online behavior, but also using your offline behavior. So for example, in the case of this example, your Coca-Cola um, drinker, you like Coke products. So essentially what could happen and what is, um, they're, they're going to try to you know, get started is using that CRM offline data 
to message you on Facebook based on the purchases you've been, you've been making. So you know maybe it's Pepsi wanting to send you an offer for a drink that can, competes with Coke. Or maybe it's Coke trying a new product out. Um, just being able to to reach you while you're on Facebook to let you know, hey, we you know we see you're interested in our brand. Thank you so much. You know, continue your purchase by using this offer to buy more, whatever the case may be. Sounds kind of creepy, but I would be okay with that if I was getting coupons for things that you know I'm already interested in versus getting spammed with stuff that is totally irrelevant to me. Um, then the third thing, as far as targeting goes, is this idea of lookalike targeting, and I've actually had a couple reps reach out to me just this past week about lookalike targeting. So to quickly give you um, an idea of what this means, on the display side of things, on like general online sites, you can use lookalike targeting as, as it is right now. And basically what lookalike targeting does is it identifies your online audience. So who frequents your website or who, who frequently makes X purchase. So they identify what that user looks like. Then they go out and find other people that look just like that person to, again, increase sales or whatever the case may be, find more people that look like your core audience. Um, so the idea with Facebook using lookalike targeting would be something like identifying the core audience of your brand's Facebook page. So when we talk about making a relevant message and getting in front of people that are engaged with your page and getting more of those, lookalike would play into that very well because now you're not just sending out a promoted post um, in the hopes that it sticks, but you're finding people that you already know are engaging with your page and accessing that content and getting more of those same type of, types of people. So um, this is something that's happened or that's starting to happen within Facebook using offline data, but there's still that um, gap between using Facebook data as well and, you know, like these um, exchanges and, and other site data to find these people. There's still kind of a gap right there that I think as we continue to see Facebook evolve and change, it's going to be not only using someone's online um, history and then when they get to Facebook, but as well, what are they doing within Facebook? So, you know, using the retargeting example, not only are you getting a coupon for JetBlue, but you might be pushed to the JetBlue page or use JetBlue um, Facebook page information to continue to target you within that space. So um, I think there's going to be more to come with all of this, but I'm, I'm definitely excited to see you know, how they're going to continue to evolve targeting and making sure that they're really in front of the most relevant people. Um, the fourth thing that we're kind of looking at, which isn't really too much of a surprise, is mobile. But what is surprising is just how quickly mobile is growing within Facebook. Um, just to give you an example, in Q2, mobile ad dollars were up 41% versus Q1. So this isn't you know, very surprising considering so much of their online audience or Facebook users are accessing Facebook through mobile or tablet devices. Um, a few weeks ago, the, the Facebook stock price went up to like $50, which was the first time since they went public. And much of that was largely, largely contributed to um, mobile, fan, mobile ads. So just being more accessible and for advertisers, you know, when Timeline was first introduced, mobile was a premium product. Being able to buy a mobile ad was a premium product. So um, within the last few months, we've seen that mobile targeting and being able to push your ads to mobile devices have been much easier, and it, it just makes sense. And we're seeing that, bless you, that targeting um, and being able to go to those devices is effective. You know, we're getting our engagements are up, our click-throughs are up. Um, so all across the board, it just seems to be working very well, and and um, you know, their stock is showing up. So that's going to take it over to talk more about the social side of things and how that's evolving. Well, it's interesting when you were talking about mobile. Um, you know, for us, we love, we run a bunch of campaigns on social media. So when Liz is planning these ads, we have to be very careful on understanding our audience and audiences and making sure that's the first priority before we kick off a campaign because we're thinking about the ad units and the types of messaging and what exactly we want to start on social media, we have to think about how users are engaging with Facebook. Are they on their mobile? Are they on their desktop? Are they on tablet? 
And it's different actually for every client that we've seen, so it's just something to think about. But into what's trending now for social media. I've harped on today a million times that uh, visual content is king. Um, so really, Facebook is leading the way on all social medias, and you know, as of recently, um, Facebook has have partnered with Instagram, so that's going to be something that's going to be huge moving forward. Any way that you guys can think of incorporating visuals into your content is what you should be doing into your traditional editorial calendars. So taking a look at just the overall top 10 brands on Facebook, they say videos are 12 times more likely to be shared and interacted with than photos and links. Uh, excuse me, text posts and links. Photos are two times more likely. So that's just a quick content there. Um, and again, we're just going to continue to see further integration of Instagram and Facebook. That, that sharing is going to be even more seamless as time goes on. So not only is just visual storytelling part of what we do, but I'm going to talk a little bit today about what it means to be a community manager. Also talk a little bit about the new technologies some new ones that were just recently released and maybe even a look ahead, and also content marketing. So at Gatesman Plus Day, we're not just sitting in the corner, you know, posting anything we want. We have a very strict plan that we actually like to follow. So we plan ahead as much as possible. You know, social media in real time, nature of the business, you never know what conversations are going to be the most prevalent but it's important that you can plan ahead as much as possible. And it's important that not only are you planning, you're also being quick and nimble, because if you're not quick and nimble, you're never gonna be able to adapt to hit those real-time conversations. So just a few of my favorite things of being a community manager. Um, I'm a sponge. I understand that the community is a living and breathing thing, and it has a mind of its own. And as a community manager, it's my job to figure out kind of what makes that audience tick and figure out the best ways to tailor content according to their needs. In addition, I'm a traffic cop. So there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you know, it's, it's my job to be able to handle some of those ugly situations. So on behalf of reputation management, my traditional PR hat, I feel like that's something that fits perfectly into social media. Um, you know, if there's ever an instance where something is going wrong on Facebook, it's an opportunity to be transparent. Never try and hide anything. And that's something that we approach um, at Gatesman Plus Dave. So not only are we working ahead to plan that content, but part of our approach is to make sure that we're tracking and we're making sure that the things that we are sharing are effective. Because in my head, I could think that something is really good, but it's not. And the only way that I'm ever going to know is through tracking those insights and analytics. Um, some of the brand pages are actually already rolling out some of the new insights and analytics, um, but overall everyone should have them October 8th. So make sure you know that that's coming and explore it when, when it does transition over. There's some really good stuff that um, is telling for, from your audiences. In addition, you know, we're making sure that we're adopting best practices. We don't want our content to be longer than, say, 240 characters on Facebook. We know that you know, it's, people are scrolling through Facebook. I watched my husband do it the other day. He literally just scrolls on his tablet like this. What stops him? A picture. So it goes to show just how interesting those things are. Maybe you guys do that as well. But keep your content short. Say what you want to say right off the bat. Keep it engaging. So insights can help you develop campaign strategies and activate tactics, but again, it's important to be nimble. Why be nimble? Because Facebook is always developing something new. And maybe, like we talked about earlier, it's not completely ready and maybe it has some bugs, but they're gonna release it. And so I wanted to share, um, focusing on a few new things that have been recently released. Um, who has the new news? Only a few. I don't have it yet, and I'm extremely jealous for those of you who do have it. But Newsfeed is really cool. Um, one of the, the ways that they're, they're doing um, the news, Newsfeed is making sure your experience is the same no matter how you're accessing Facebook. Whether you're accessing on desktop, whether you're accessing on tablet, whether you're accessing on mobile. Facebook wants to make sure that that rich experience is exactly the same across the board. So really what you're looking to have is, a, is an experience that's authentic and rich. In addition, there's good news for brands. People are going to be able to catalog how they want their newsfeed to appear. So 
So you're going to be able to, um, you know, categorize by the brands that you follow. You can make sure that that you get all that information, and that's prevalent right now in Newsfeed, but people aren't using it, so they're going to push that first and foremost. In addition, you know, pictures are bigger, brighter, bolder, so you're going to see a lot of aesthetic updates as well here. Um, graph search was also rolled out not too long ago, and what's interesting about graph search is focusing less on those keyword searches and more about a search that is, you know, how you talk. So instead of saying, you know, Liz and, um, you know, restaurants, I can, or excuse me, instead of saying um, restaurants in Pittsburgh, I can actually type restaurants that Liz follows. Because I trust Liz and her recommendations and everything that, you know, maybe she, she enjoys, I might enjoy. I am going to be able to see what restaurants Liz has been at. I'm going to see the photos that she's taken at those restaurants. I'm going to be able to see maybe what she checked in. And if she wrote a review about it, I'm going to be able to see it. So graph search enables users to really search in, in terms of how they think. Um, not too long ago, I don't know if you guys knew this, um, about a month ago, uh, Google did the same thing with Hummingbird updates to their algorithm. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah, so I think that this is going to be a, a new trend for a lot of search engines. Um, Facebook kind of led the way. Google did it right under our noses. We didn't really see any impact on our brand's pages. But just be aware that that's something that um, these different tech companies are moving towards. They want to make sure that they're engaging um, search in a way that users are capitalizing in on relationships. So. In addition to just graph search, one of the, the new additions that's coming out soon, um, it's not available yet on my personal page, but being able to search by post. So if people are talking about Dancing with the Stars, if people are talking about the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Bucks, um, you, know, you could go through and search those specifically on behalf of your friends. It will be interesting, too, to see how this impacts brands. We're hopeful that people are going to be typing in some of our clients' names, but you never know. Uh, in addition to that, another visual update, I sound like a broken record, but um, links. Links have bigger, bolder, better pictures now as well. So um, not too long ago, a couple, a couple weeks ago, Facebook released hashtags. Do you guys think that hashtags are increasing engagement or working against engagement on Facebook? Any thoughts? Not so much. <laughs> They're actually competing against EdDrink. And hashtags, Twitter, Twitter, it makes so much sense for Twitter because think of about the massive amount of content that's going on any given second on Twitter. Hashtags are a way to organize that content. Facebook already has a way to organize content, and that's through the Edrink algorithm. So in essence, hashtags aren't really working. Some of our brands we're testing, we want to see if they're using. We want to see if maybe they're going to be updating those algorithms over time. But, you know, it, it kind of makes me laugh, like the recent um, SNL skit with uh, Justin Timberlake and, <laughs> was it Jimmy Kimmel or? <laughs> that, one. that was hilarious. And we, this is just something that we we're, we're going to be watching over time. Uh, in addition to that, Facebook and Twitter are having a battle. Um, they're going to be doing trending topics as well. So does this relate to hashtags? Yes and no. So we're going to be monitoring that as well. So, what's next? Yeah, I mean, um, as, as we've pointed out, there's a lot of things that are kind of on the horizon that are changing, that are you know, ongoing. Some of these updates are happening, and we're not even aware of it yet. So, um, I think from a paid perspective, um, what I'd like to see continue to happen is that the targeting does just get smarter, and that brands and advertisers are better with how they're placing their paid ads because what I hate seeing is advertising that's more of an annoyance than anything helpful. So um, I'm really excited to see kind of how the targeting continues to evolve so that we could be more effective in reaching our audience and getting in front of the right people. So that's how I hope things are going to continue to evolve, but, but we'll see. Yeah. And um, you know, for the traditional side of things, as a, being a strategic brand manager, I really see that Facebook is going to further continue to allow users to personalize their experience. We're seeing that through updates through Newsfeed, where users can actually integrate you know, and prioritize what they want to see first and foremost. So that's something that is going to be continuing to evolve over time. Um, 
In addition, I think that Facebook is also going to make it easier for brands to participate on Facebook. So at one point, you know, we talked about not that many people using ads. Liz went over the different ad units. Um, they recently updated promotions on Facebook, which used to be very strict guidelines where you could only house um, promotions on a separate iframe is now something that can be run on the wall. So that's going to be easy for maybe a brand that doesn't have a, an extensive budget to host something to make sure that their fans real, feel rewarded. So we think that you know that customization and further ways for anyone, any brand to participate, no matter how big or small you are, is going to be um, something that continues to move forward. So it's vital that you know our media team, our social team, and also our creative teams work together now more than ever. I wanted to leave you with some key takeaways today. Best to be quick and nimble. You know, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow, and you got to make sure that you're thinking proactively on how this can be beneficial to not only you as a community manager, but for your brand. Having that open mind is going to allow you to do that. Be proactive and think ahead. Yeah, and um, like Beth mentioned, you know, something that we are constantly pushing at, at our agency, Agency Games and Plus Dave, is the integration. And something that we really didn't touch on was the creative aspect of things as well. When all of these ad units are changing or when there's new ones that exist, we're telling our creative guys, hey, look, this is what's going on. Now we only have, you know, 25 characters or whatever it is. So we're keeping them in the loop as well and um, working to come up with creative solutions all together. So it's really important for everyone to be integrated and working together. Mm -hmm. And I think Liz hit, hit on a key point there. It's all about solutions. You gotta get out of the mindset of these sidewinders, these different specialties that you have. You get rid of those, you're gonna be able to see kind of what the overall problem is and how you can pr work together to provide those solutions. And I think that's, that's why we've been so successful in some of our past campaigns as well. Um, again, visual storytelling will continue to rise. And like I talked about way too much, the hyper-targeting, which you know, I'm all about. Hopefully that keeps working, but we just need to be aware of the changes and how we can be smarter with our targeting solutions. Mm -hmm. And whether you like it or not, Facebook is going to continue to pump up their advertising. So whatever they can do to offer brands and their managers um, new different types of products, you know, the good news is, is that content, if Liz is doing a good job like I know she is, you're not going to be able to recognize that it's an ad. It's not going to be annoying. It's going to be extremely relevant to your life. And Facebook is going to stand behind that. They're going to support that because that's what's bringing in the dough for them. Um, that's all we had today. I hope you guys have questions. If you do, please raise your hand. <laughs> yes? Yeah, hi. I have a question you uh, heard you talk about engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see um, like, uh, an inverse relationship between the number of likes and the and the proportion of engagement. Like you know, brands in the small brands in the hundred thousand followers in like, you know, range have double digit and have up to double digit engagement rates. Uh, if you go to somebody like an MTV or an Apple, uh, engagement drops down to, 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 to like decimals, like mm -hmm. zero point five percent. How do you how do you measure, how do you track the Absolutely. You know, insights and analytics are the biggest things that we're taking a look at for that engagement. But we also want to make sure that the content that we're creating, people are interacting with it. And if they're not, then we have to tweak it. So making sure, you know, some of the things you did, had mentioned, some of those larger brand pages might not have those high engagement num numbers. They might not have the manpower to stand behind all those numbers to individually respond to them. So that might be part of their own strategy. But for us as community managers, we want to make sure that that quality experience is really there. And if people are coming onto the page and they are interacting with our content, we want to make sure that they know that we appreciate it. So we communicate back with them. And we also you know, make sure that if they have issues, if they have problems, that they're heard. So that's really important. And making sure that those interactions are um, you know, really there and that you're actually engaging with those people. If they're coming to your page, thank them. So that's one of the things that we love to do. Um, I run paid media for an online university, and out of all of our display initiatives, Facebook has 
been the rock star. Um, so we've done custom audience targeting, lookalike targeting. Uh, we even use Facebook for lead nurturing, so we'll upload lists of email addresses from people who haven't converted into an application or a student and kind of use that as another way to engage them with the brand. Um, so in August, we saw our performance metrics just kind of tank. Um, and what the Facebook rep says is there was a change in the algorithm. But they're being very cryptic about what that was mm -hmm. and how to kind of rebound from that. And I was just curious as a paid manager yourself if you've noticed any kind of decrease in performance with the campaigns that you're managing. I honestly haven't. Um, and in fact, I've actually seen with so let me just remind, some of the things that I do to kind of help make sure that my performance is consistent and stable is run different types of units within a campaign and I break out my campaigns. So if I'm targeting parents, I might have one group, uh, one campaign that's just parents and then within that uh, an ad dedicated to mobile, one dedicated to desktop devices. Then I'll have a separate campaign, you know how with an ads manager you can have multiple campaigns but all working for the common good, um, targeted to moms. And maybe within that I have, again, a desktop ad and one for mobile. Then what I do is look at all of the ads within that campaign to see what's performing and then I'm careful to shift my budget wherever it's working the best. If I do start to see this like, and it's not getting better, Sometimes I'll reset the, the campaign just to trick the algorithm into thinking it's new ads to get them going again. And I've seen that happen, you know, at our agency sometimes we're at the mercy of other, other teams' creative, so it might not be a message that I've recommended or I might say I don't think that's the most effective copy. But if we have that to work with and there's creative ways to get that performance there, even if you're limited with creative, and those are some of the tricks that I've kind of run into to kind of help boost that performance if we're seeing a dip. Um, there's one thing that is really uh, annoying about Facebook is they do these updates and they don't tell you. So you can have your dollars out there working and then all of a sudden something pickups and you've got to explain to your client like, hey, we, we tanked this week and I don't know why. So I try to every morning go in, check the ads, make, make sure I'm seeing consistent performance. And if I'm starting to see that decline, then I'll reset the system or shift dollars to whatever is really working. Does that help? Any other questions for him? So you had an earlier number about uh, younger folks using Facebook. I forget what the percentage was. But I, I get the general sense that they're no, they, they don't seem to be using Facebook as much. It's been, I've heard that, plus it's been my personal opinion. Does that seem to be the case? Is there the kids still really using Facebook? I, the kids. <laughs> yes, um, but I think too what I've heard that, that might be what you're thinking too is that these older demos are starting to take to Facebook more. So while maybe back a few years ago the younger demos had much larger piece of the pie because it's expanded to you know, their parents. My mother's on Facebook now. She doesn't really use it. But you know, we've got these um, older demos entering Facebook to see kind of what's, what's all this chatter about. So I've seen more of a shift like that where we, we are able, you know, we'll have clients ask to reach a 65 plus demo with Facebook ads. And like, I don't really know that that's the best use of your dollars, but we are seeing that more audiences are taking to Facebook. So that's kind of the shift that I've been seeing. Yeah, and I think um, kind of the younger audience is very comfortable with social media, so they're quick to adopt to other ones as well. So, you know, people got used to Facebook. It was something that they feel very comfortable and familiar with. This younger audience might, you know, feel much more comfortable with social media, looking to things like Tumblr, looking to things like Twitter, and kind of spreading that user behavior. behavior. But to Liz's point, the fastest growing audience on Facebook is actually 55 plus. I don't know if that surprises you guys, but that's, you know, where we're seeing the biggest leap. Yes? Probably a dumb question to people that work in Facebook all the time, but uh, I come I mean, in a different world and my biggest advertising and I've ever spent on Facebook is like five dollars a day. Um, so I do it often. Mm -hmm. So I think in the old times you spent
spend money on advertising and then like and people bought more code to be like that was worth that money on advertising. But now what I struggle with is I'm usually advertising for people to like know about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to ever tell if Facebook money accomplishes anything. So I don't have something for people to buy. At best I have an event that I'm running. And uh, I don't know if more people so, do you have any customers where this is a problem, or is all just like if people buy their products, you can track what you to know if your ads are working? How do you know if this stuff is working? Right. I think what we struggle with more is helping people identify what those performance metrics are. Um, for example, for events. We'll have event ads up that are pushing to like a generic URL that really doesn't talk too much about the event. So what we try to do is say, you know, if you're ultimately trying to get more people to this event, then use an event ad or have a page dedicated to this event, push people there to directly sign up to kind of help really see the effectiveness. Um, so, but I, I don't think that Facebook ads necessarily have to work towards like a retail direct response type of objective to be effective. I just think it's about really using the tools the most effective way and identifying that KPI, that key performance indicator to understand, okay, what worked and what didn't. Um, we use Facebook ads a lot just to push, push traffic to a new website that might speak about, you know, the brand and, and in your case, you know, what you guys are all about. Um, and you can track, you could put um, pixels within your page to see exactly how much traffic you drove from those Facebook ads. So to, to identify, you know, exactly how effective that was. So I think more importantly, it's just about being smart with how you're measuring and, and understanding exactly what you hope to accomplish through the ad. I like to add to that too. I think before you get started, it is so important to figure out what your objectives are. And for Facebook advertising, it's recommended to only have one objective. It shouldn't be to drive people to my event and get them to like my page. It's either one or the other. Um, and there's ways that you could integrate, maybe even, like, if, if the event sign-up is on your website, per se, um, you could create a custom URL that is specific to the Facebook ad that you could track in your analytics how many people are clicking that over. Same thing if it's just awareness. If you want people to know about your brand, you know, you could create a custom URL through your Facebook advertising, hit that up through your um, Google Analytics, and make sure see how many people are clicking. You can assume that people are clicking, they're starting to know about your brand, the awareness is increasing. So that's just one specific way. Any others? What specifically? Just the adoption or, you know, we have this conversation so many times with our clients. And actually, you know, it's always been it's going to be so hard to, to get people who are on the Wicking and Thought Facebook, who are on Twitter, to actually go over to Google+. Google+, Plus has a lot of really neat features. One, you know, the Google Hangouts. But more importantly, everything's connected. Your email, you know, your, your searching behaviors, your calendar, all those different things. So while the thought of it seems really cool, I think what's making people hesitant to actually make the leap over is, you know, those circles that you create on Google Plus, how it's so hard to invite brands to be part of those circles. And I think that's kind of been the biggest hindrance. But with um, Google rhythm, or excuse me, Google's recent algorithm updates through Hummingbird, we really think that the way people are searching might actually have an impact on Google Plus. And actually just talking with some of the SEO experts at our agency, they're saying, you need to start thinking about Google Plus. My personal opinion, I'm like, I've heard this 12 times before, I don't want to hear it anymore. But with this new update, it could be different. So we're keeping an eye on it, for sure. Any others? Did you have your name? I did. Uh, a very easy question. How long is too long for a campaign on Facebook? Well, how long you run? <laughs> well, see, that's just it. There are certain campaigns that we will run that are almost evergreen. Mm -hmm. We simply refresh the mm -hmm. content style and the delivery and what words we're using, what pictures, so forth. Mm -hmm. 
but um, say it is a campaign for some specified event, how far out do you want to hit, given that the attention span of a gnat is a nanosecond? So you don't want to be too far out, because then people will lose interest. You don't want to be too close. Yes, and that's maybe a perfect example of kind of what we do. Like within our social content strategy, we're going to make sure that we're going to start teasing the contest or whatever promotion that we're running. Then when we get closer, that might be an opportunity to say, Liz, we're kicking off in a week, two weeks. Let's get going with this. Um, typically, when we're actually into the campaign, we like to do gut, gut checks every eight weeks. Um, certainly, you're going to be checking very quickly soon after it kicks off. But that hard gut check at eight weeks to see, do I need to tweak anything? Do I need to make anything better? But that depends if it's like a three long month program. If it's you know, a month program, you're going to want to check way sooner. So it just depends on how long you have it running. And sometimes it depends on you know, maybe it's a seasonal offer or a seasonal promotion. Um, and that's with our experience. Our clients, they have a lot of seasonal promotions. So that's kind of what we work against. But it just really depends on what the event is or the promotion. And I would, I would say, too, that um, more of a problem is not, at least for the paid piece of it, is not running it long enough. Um, because you've got so many algorithms working on the back end of things that are kind of out of your control, you want to make sure you're giving them enough time to ramp up so you can see that performance. Um, we've had campaigns that we've been instructed only run these two days to push for, you know, it's like a Saturday event and they just want to run banners Thursday and Friday and that's it. And that's not effective because Facebook needs time to see what's going to be working so that it can really optimize and so that you can make those changes as well based on what Korea is working best, what type of ad unit, what target. Um, so I always say at least a week, maybe even a week and a half, just to give it time to perform. Um, and then for longer campaigns, just keeping an eye on those ads to see, you know, you're starting to see that taper on performance. What are some things you can do to, to kind of reset it and trick it and, and get that performance back up, which it sounds like you are already keeping an eye on anyways. In that case, I would go to promoted posts if it was two or three days away. I'm simply going to do promoted posts yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and keep the dollars light, and I'm still going to get the penetration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't forget about some of the, the things that are just on the page as well. So utilize that pin post, create an events tab in your cover photo, see if there's a way that you can draw attention to it. All those different types of things match with the paid media is really going to help boost that visibility and success factor. Any others? All right. Well, thank you guys so much. We appreciate you guys sitting in. And if you have any questions, please come see us. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys.